Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. Ayn Rand, The Virtue of Selfishness. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue our journey through history's most important novel. The opening of chapter 66 echoes the defeat of Don Quixote in the previous chapter. Our hero looks back on Barcelona and declares his epic loss. Here was Troy. Here my fortune finally fell, never to rise again. It would seem the Reconquista has ended. Sancho responds with stoic advice. Valiant hearts, my lord, are just as obliged to suffer disgrace as they are to enjoy prosperity. He also points out that fortune is a drunk and capricious woman, and above all else, blind, and thus she sees not what she does, nor does she know who she destroys or who she glorifies. If Machiavelli famously called fortune a woman, Sancho makes her drunk, fickle, and blind. If the Italian political philosopher inaugurated the fallen condition of the modern world with his portrait of the pragmatic prince who must sometimes be ruthless in order to preserve the state against the vagaries of fortune, our first modern novelist pushes the capricious nature of fortune to the point of ridiculousness. And meanwhile, he eschews the powerful portrait of a prince in favor of that of a fallen Christian knight. In his response, Don Quixote remarks on his squire's transformation. You've turned very philosophical, Sancho. And the knight resigns himself to his new status. Now, when I have become an ordinary squire, I will give credit to my words by keeping the one I gave as my promise. Sancho now complains about having to walk and suggests that they follow the ancient custom of leaving the hero's armaments hanging in a tree as a kind of monument. Don Quixote agrees and even quotes Ariosto, let no one move them who cannot withstand a fight with Roland. As an indication that things are now falling apart with increasing speed, Don Quixote is so discombobulated that he quickly changes his mind. Sancho agrees to the change of plans through a refrain that alludes to a major problem in part one. The fault of the ass should not be heaped on the pack saddle. Did you know the medieval source of thinking about the figure of fortune in Spain was Juan de Menas's Las Trescientas, 1435. At this point, our heroes arrive at what is no less than the novel's sixth inn where a group of people have gathered. They debate a case in which a fat man who weighs 11 arrobas has challenged a slimmer man who weighs no more than five to a race. The fat man insists the lighter man be handicapped. He said that the man he had challenged who weighs five arrobas should carry six in iron on his back. And that way the 11 arrobas of the thin man would equal the 11 of the fat man. It's Sancho's final judgment. By contrast, Don Quixote is so melancholy that he has practically given up on life. Respond in due course, Sancho, my friend. As for me, I'm so low, I couldn't grant crumbs to a cat. Those felines again. Sancho rules that the fat man should lop the extra weight off his body. The result is general amazement as all agree to cancel the race and get drunk instead. Moreover, they praise this final indication of Sancho's princely wisdom by speculating that our Hidalgo and Squire are smart enough to go to the University of Salamanca and become rulers. I'll bet if they were to study at Salamanca, they'd be court magistrates in a flash. There's another dose of political cynicism here. When a man least expects it, he finds himself with a staff in his hand or a miter on his head. Our heroes press on, and now we get proof of the arbitrary nature of fortune. According to the narrator, when they least expect it, a man appears walking with some saddlebags around his neck. Just as we saw Sancho and Torralba do long ago in part one. The man seems to be a letter carrier. He grasps Don Quixote by the right thigh and declares that his master, the Duke, will be most happy to learn that Don Quixote is returning to his castle. Don Quixote does not recognize this man, who turns out to be 
Tosilos, the young man who had played the part of the knight who surrendered to Don Quixote in order to marry the daughter of Doña Rodriguez. Quixotic mission. What university should Don Quixote and Sancho attend according to the people gathered in front of the sixth hotel of the novel? A. Francisco Marroquín University B. University of Salamanca C. University of Bologna Correct answer, B. University of Salamanca This seems to reprise the role of the shepherd boy Andres in part one. When Don Quixote recalls that enchanters had transformed his enemy at the joust into one of the Duke's lackeys, Dosilos hushes him and asserts reality. Quiet, good man, for there was no enchantment at all, nor any transformation of anyone's face. I entered the field Tosilos the footman, and I left the field the footman Tosilos. Moreover, the Duke was so angered that he gave him 100 lashes. We even learned that Doña Rodriguez has returned to Castile and that her daughter ended up a nun. Tosilo now states that he is on his way to Barcelona to deliver a bundle of letters for the Viceroy sent to him by my master. This somehow seems to tie back to the story of Ricote, or perhaps even to the meta-literary scene in the printing shop. Tosilos then offers Don Quixote and Sancho wine and cheese. Don Quixote moves on, insisting that this courier is enchanted and this Tosilos is counterfeit. As usual, however, Sancho pauses to join the lackey in food and drink. The themes are peace and commerce. He and Sancho sat down on the green grass and in peaceful companionship, they devoured and dispatched the entire contents of the saddlebags. A final pun even underscores Don Quixote's return to sanity as an economic matter. Tosilos observes, without a doubt, Sancho, my friend, this master of yours is short on sanity. Sancho defends his master. Short? How so? He never shorts anybody. He pays for everything, and even more when the currency is madness. The metaphor indicates that when it comes to madness, his master is in debt to nobody. In other words, that Don Quixote's insanity is all his own and that it amounts to a small fortune. And yet, it hints at the larger lesson on the importance of learning about commercial and financial realities. That's all for now. Keep reading, the story only gets better in the final chapters. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.